This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. There's a lot going on inside your ear. That rubbery, bendy bit on the side of your head, the part you might have skewered with some metal. It's called the pinna, with an I and two N's. With an A-E on the end if it's plural, because, you know, Latin. And speaking of which, in Latin, pinna means fin or wing, which is funny to think about actually, that those little, and sometimes big, swirly chunks of skin and cartilage, those are our wings. And suddenly Dumbo makes a little more sense, doesn't he? Anyway, the pinna is important because it acts like something of a radar dish. Or actually, it's probably more appropriate to say that radar dishes act like our ears, is a kind of funnel, a shape for collecting and directing. I mean, in the case of a radar, right, it's radio waves and it's being directed towards some kind of sensor, some piece of high technology. But in the case of human beings, sound gets collected and directed down the middle ear to the inner ear and eventually the brain parts that turn it into beautiful and useful electrical impulses. Think about that from your speakers or headphones, bouncing around all kinds of surfaces, passing through all of these membranes and tiny little sensors somewhere in your skull getting turned into little electrical blips. That is my voice. And that's how you're hearing it. The pinna also changes the sound it collects. Think like how your voice sounds different in different rooms. When you speak in the bathroom, it sounds different from when you're in the car, from when you're in the cathedral, to when you've stuck your head down a well. The shape and material of those spaces changes the way things inside them sound. Or, more specifically, in every space, acoustic vibrations behave differently and therefore sound differently to our ears. And your ear itself is actually no different. The shape of your pinna, of your wing fin, collects and directs, but also filters the sound that comes into it. Sound bounces around and off your ear the same way it does around and inside larger spaces. Just like with larger spaces, the sound doing the bouncing changes as a result of the bouncing. This filtering that happens gets rid of frequencies, bits of sonic information that are biological equipment isn't built to deal with pitches too low or too high for us to hear anyway. The filtering, coupled with the fact that we have two ears, one on each side of our head, 
also helps us to determine directionality or where a sound is coming from. It's why when someone shouts your name from, like, 20 yards behind you and slightly to the left, hey, how's it going? you know instantly where they are, where that sound came from. However, it's where that sound is going to that I'm interested in right now. After the outer ear, comprised of the pinna, the eardrum, some muscles, the ear canal, which is that part you might occasionally dig a finger into, regardless of all of the warnings your grandmother gave you that you should never put anything smaller than your elbow in there. After all that stuff comes the middle ear. It's neat and important, and someday we're going to talk more about it, but for right now, we're going to skip over it completely and go right to the inner ear. The inner ear is made of the cochlear and vestibular systems, which help us to hear and balance, respectively. The cochlear system has chambers and membranes. It houses this thing called the organ of corti, which has thousands of these tiny little hairs. They're called stereocilia. And when sound pressure waves get collected and directed by the outer ear through the middle ear and into the inner ear, this is where they're turned from physical phenomena into brain-feeding electrical impulses. The vestibular system contains a number of canals filled with fluid, and depending upon which way your head is pointed, the movement of that fluid in those canals lets your brain know where up is at. Imagine it's like one of those levels that you use when you're hanging a bookshelf, except it's inside your head. Interestingly, these systems are made up of labyrinths. Like, actually. Well, well, I mean, not actually, actually, but it is what they're called. The membranous labyrinth, full of goop and fluid and canals, sits inside the bony labyrinth, which forms the walls, providing the whole thing with structure and protection. And collectively, it's all called the labyrinth of the inner ear, a structure which looks remarkably like one of Henry Moore's reclining figure sculptures. It's kind of like this looping shape, almost um, like a pretzel stood up on its side, connected to a kind of recumbent torso, at the top of which, instead of one of Moore's round or, or pointy kind of dainty heads is the cochlea, which is shaped in this really dramatic spiral. So, I don't know if you've ever looked inside your own ear, if you're like me, and I suspect, like most people, the answer is no, since doing so would certainly be some kind of production, a series of mirrors, perhaps an ear-peering buddy to help with a camera or some kind of contraption. But I recently had the occasion to look for no small amount of time into my dog Jack's ear. He somehow, he managed to get a pretty nasty infection, and part of his 7-10 to 10 day regimen was this battery of washing and soaking and rinsing and applying of ointments, and so I spent a lot of time staring down his ears, which incidentally, uh, because he's a lab mix, are significantly more wing-like than my own cranial protrusions. So, though I was only looking as far as his ear canal... You know, the middle and inner ear are pretty deep into one skull, protected and set inside a, all manner of structure that you'd not want to do any kind of messing with. But anyways, while I was looking in his ear canal, the meaningfulness of the word labyrinth really struck me. The pinna doesn't belong to the part of the auditory system referred to as a labyrinth, but in a way it's, it's no less labyrinthine for that fact. The twists and turns of the outer ear, the effect of some endless amount of passive design and redesign as genetics and evolution quietly and slowly do their work, contribute to some overall shape, which is... I mean, if it's not labyrinthine, it's certainly circuitous. It meanders, it winds and snakes. It may be craggy or delicate, but it is by no means wholly smooth or direct. That both the inner and outer structures of the ear, the pinna, and the labyrinth of the inner ear, that the structure which allows or causes hearing, or not as the case may be, is named and appears maze-like or mystifying is, I think, some kind of beautiful accident. <laughs> 
beautiful because for lots of us, finding our way through sound, especially sound which has been organized or layered like music, the sound effects and dialogue tracks for movies, talking with friends in a crowded bar, is an act of navigation, of trying to find a path, feeling along the walls, trying to traverse some uncertain space. Sound is mysterious. It exists in some kind of ether. I mean, that's what, right? That's what we said it was for so long. In antiquity, sound was a disturbance in the ether. And I don't know, well, I guess that's still kind of true. Anyways, we even ask if sound really exists when there's nothing around to hear it. We don't ask, at least not as frequently or as seriously, if objects stop having the qualities that make them visible when we close our eyes. We ask if a tree falls and there's no one around to hear it, does it still make a sound? But we don't ask if that same tree stops reflecting light, stops being a visible object if there's no one there to look at it. Or if the bark of it stops having texture when we are not touching it. By comparison, these questions seem a little absurd, though they were the philosopher George Barclay's bread and butter. He, he said that material things were only ideas in the minds of the people who perceived them, and that they couldn't exist without being perceived by someone's senses. But that, I mean, that sounds, in general, crazy, right? And yet it seems reasonable to ask if sound is still there when we don't hear it. Because of its ephemeral nature, questions about sound quickly turn into questions about the fundamental nature of perception and sensation and physical phenomena. A thing's visual existence is prime. Its sonic existence is something else. Things do not exist as sound. They produce sound. A thing's sound is separate, a force loosed from it whereas its physical and visual existence are very neatly bound up into one nice little package. My dog Jack, for instance, is not his bark. He is black and medium-sized and has these big, dopey eyes. Those visual qualities are him, but the sound he makes when the contractor comes into the house to take a look at that part of the kitchen wall that needs to be fixed, the sound conversationally at least, that he makes, is not Jack. It's not him. It's something he does. Something separate. Something to be perceived and navigated separately. We see, I think, more than we hear. At least assuming that your neurobiological equipment functions as intended. It's unclear, to me at least, whether this is a cause or effect of sound's ephemeral, mysterious nature. Is sight more relied upon because sound is so inscrutable? Or is it that, given vision's concrete and pervasive representation of the world, have we never asked, at least not nearly most of us, sound to do the heavy lifting, the interpretive and world-building legwork we constantly and so naturally do with sight? Or maybe it's that since light travels faster and farther and the visible spectrum is so much wider and more densely packed on a pure information and resolution level, we can, actually literally, see more than we hear. I'm sure that has something to do with it. Either way, our sense of hearing is very easily overwhelmed and confused. Most of us have trouble picking individual instruments out of um, the mix in a piece of recorded music. Many of us will handily point out ridiculous or unbelievable special effects in movies or photoshops in print ads, but identifying bad dialogue edits or poorly chosen sound effects remains something of a superpower. The sound world is one which needs parsing, parceling, much more so than the visual world. And because of this, it goes, in my estimation at least, far less interrogated. Beyond knowing what the bassoon sounds like or that this scene is mostly dialogue that was recorded in a studio and not on location when they were filming, our day-to-day -day experience of sound's cryptic existence 
that it doesn't demand more of our attention, that situations where we fundamentally rely on it are much fewer and farther between than is the case with sight means it goes far more unscrutinized. We ask fewer questions of our sense of hearing. If it's to be believed, if it can do more, if the world becomes somehow different when we give it primacy. The sonic landscape, as it turns out, isn't really a landscape at all, but a labyrinth. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been reasonably sound.